God bless you, and it's good to be with you again today. Thanks so much for coming out for fellowshipping and to gather around as we study God's Word again today together. And I've got a special announcement for you today. We started in Tel Aviv, Israel about eight and a half years ago. Actually, we started the fellowship in Tel Aviv, Israel eight years ago in this last July. This is August now in 2012. Eight years ago, we started. And of course, when we started teaching through the Bible, we started in the book of Genesis because, of course, in Hebrew, that is better sheet or beginning, in the beginning. And so what better place to begin in the Word of God than in the beginning? And so it's been eight years now. And as I look out among the people and everything that are coming to the congregations, Haifa, Israel, and throughout Israel today and online, I realize that there's a whole new group of people that are different than the people who came when we first started eight years ago. And what is more Jewish than to start with the very beginning of the Torah in Hasefer Bereshit, or the book of Genesis. And so I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could study through the book of Genesis again together and start at the start, start at the beginning in the book of beginnings, Basefer Bereshit in the book of Genesis. And so that's what I'd like to do today. But any time that you're going to start in the book of Genesis, you first need to talk a little bit about what it is that you think about the Bible, what it is that you believe about the Bible that so many people call the Word of God. And I call it the Word of God because it has proven itself to me that no one else could have the knowledge about future events. No one else could speak the way that this author speaks except for God. And so as he puts these things in the Bible, it lets us know that this message is truly from him. That's why it's the best-selling book of all time, you know. The second place book is not even close. They don't even count the Bible anymore because the Bible has always been the best-selling book throughout all of history, all of printed presses and all of the printings and books and that have been printed through the centuries. The Bible has always been the best-selling book and the most popular book of all times. But let's go into detail in the book of Genesis. But before we do that, I want to just give you a little bit of background. You know, as you look at nature all around you, you go outside, you look up at the night sky, you look at the tiny flowers and the little bitty insects and the different colored of fish in the sea and the different types of birds that are in the air and all the creatures that exist then you have to wonder, how did all of this get here? That's what the book of Genesis tells us. You have to wonder, where did all of this come from? That's what the Bible tells us. You see, nature itself causes us to be curious about God. Nature itself causes us to wonder and to ask questions about our existence. Why we're here? Why we're different? Do you ever think about that? Why are you so different than all the other creatures on the earth? Than the birds, than the different types of fish in the sea, than the different types of insects, the creatures that are on the land. Why out of all of these hundreds of thousands of species are you alone unique and different? Now think about this. You plan your life. You think about things that are going to be in the future, not just what is happening right then and there. You even choose what clothes you're going to wear. How many other species on planet Earth do you know of that do that? None. Well, think about this even more. You design vehicles like automobiles, 
like the big jumbo jets that carry you from one continent to another. You do all of these things. You design a little iPad or a little telephone. You design computers. You put satellites into space that orbit the Earth and you go to different planets and these satellites automatically land on these planets. What other creatures in all of creation is even close to doing something like that? You design great cities with huge skyscrapers shooting skyward. And all of these vehicles and hundreds of thousands and even millions of vehicles that come through these cities day and night. What other creature is like man? You see? You really are different. So no matter what anyone would otherwise tell you, remember that it's not even close. The other hundreds of thousands of species that exist aren't anywhere near the capabilities of mankind. You really can say that we're different. But if you say that, you have to ask yourself the question, why are we different? Why are you different? You're not just an accident of nature like some people would have you believe. Some people want you to think that you came from the goo through the zoo to you. But that's not the way it is. That's not where you came from. We're going to be talking about your beginnings in the book of Genesis in three weeks. This week, we're going to be talking only about one verse, the very first verse in the very first chapter in the very first book of the Bible. We're going to be talking about that one verse and how all came into existence. Next week, we're going to go into detail about the age of the universe. We're going to go into detail about other aspects of creation other than it being spoken into existence from nothing. Well, why would God give us His Word in the form of the Bible? Why is it that we need the Word of God? Why is that so important? Well, as we said earlier, nature can only tell you so much about creation. You can look at the stars in the sky. You can look at the species on the earth. You can look at the different varieties of geology in the mountains, the plains, the deserts, the green grass, the salt water, the fresh water. You can look at the rainbow in the sky, the different types of clouds and the birds that fly in different places. Then you can look through a microscope and you can see the little micro worlds that exist and bacterias and cells and single cell animals and organisms and things like that. You can see all of these things and you can wonder about God and you could be marveling at His wisdom and you can be astonished at the things that you see that He has done. But nature's revelation of God is incomplete. It doesn't tell you the whole story. For example, nature doesn't tell you, well, if God created all of this, what is He like? What is God like? What are His thoughts? What are His values? You see, nature doesn't tell you that. So the realm of nature is incomplete in its testimony about God. It tells you that God is great and powerful and glorious. Psalm 19 in the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament, or the skies at night, shows His handiwork. They declare His glory. Day to day pours forth knowledge, it says. Night to night reveals His wisdom his knowledge as he put all of this here. All of his glory, all of that power that he spoke all of this into existence. Nature tells us his power and his glory, but we still don't understand what he's like. That's why God had to give us his message in the form of the Bible is so that the rest of it would be revealed to us and we would understand exactly what he's like. What is his heart like? What are his values? What are the things that he sees are important in the universe? What are the things that he expects 
from you and I? What are the things that God wants to reveal to us to complete the story that nature is telling us? Well, that's what the Bible is. It completes that story. But now you say, well, look, the Bible is just a book, isn't it? It's just like any other book. Well, no, it's not. And I'll tell you why. The Bible has these things called prophecies. These were times when the ancient prophets, the ancient Hebrew prophets, spoke under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. And they talked about future events. They talked about things that would happen sometimes many years in the future. And they told about these events in great detail. Well, now, as we have now been thousands of years after that fact, we can look back in history and we see that these prophecies have come true exactly as they were given by the prophets two to three thousand years earlier. And nobody knows the future like that except for God. And so since these prophecies are in the Bible, we understand that this message in the Bible must have come from God. It must have come from God because no one knows the future like that except for God. Every detail about everything that would ever happen in time. And now we can look back in history where it was recorded exactly what did happen and we can compare it with the prophecies that are written in the Bible. And we can be amazed that they are so accurate, 100% accuracy, 100% of the time. And then we can have confidence that the Bible is not from any man. Oh, he may have used men to write the words, but he gave men the words. And they wrote down what he told them to write as his Holy Spirit came upon them. Well, now you see, that's important because this same Bible also talks about what we need to do to live forever. What we need to do to gain entry into the kingdom of heaven after our life on this earth. What we need to do to have everlasting life in heaven with God forever. So now we know that there's important things other than the story of creation in the Bible. He tells us how we got here, that's for sure. But then he gives us the prophecies to authenticate or to prove that the message in the Bible is really from God. And then he tells us what he wants us to tell, what he wants to tell us. He tells us what his heart is like. He tells us the things that are important to Him. And He tells us how we fell away from Him and how we can be restored to Him and have everlasting life with Him again like we were designed for. So the message that He wants to give us is certainly extremely important for us because it makes the difference between having everlasting life in heaven or not. And so pay attention. We're going to go through the message today, and we're going to start going through the Word of God, starting, beginning, in the beginning. Asefe Bereshit, the book of the beginnings. Now, did you ever wonder about that first verse in the Bible? I mean, there's so many people that have different opinions about it. Most of the time, I think people just read over that little verse and they just say, okay, well, I'm going to read the Bible or I'm going to read the book of Genesis. And they read over it and they say, oh, well, that's nice. It sounds like some poetry or something. It sounds like the start of a beautiful story. But you don't really think in detail about what that verse means. There's a wealth of information in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Genesis the one that we just quoted. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, now that's important today because some people would have you think that, no, it's just an accident. I, I'll tell you something. 
There have always been some people who would do anything they can to change the subject from God to something else because they don't want to be responsible to God. They don't want to think about a judgment for sin because they like their sin. And anytime you talk about God, they don't want to hear it. In fact, they'll try to make sure that you get shut up too, that you won't talk about it either. They'll try to prevent you from talking about Him in society. They'll try to prevent you from talking about Him to other people. They don't want to hear it. Jesus in the New Testament, Habrida Chadasha in the New Testament, in the book of John, says here's the way it is. The light shines into the darkness, and those that love the light come to the light, that their lives may be made manifest, that they want to do the right things by God. But the ones who don't want to do the right things they run from the light and they hate the light because the light will expose the dirt and the unrighteousness and the sin in their lives. But here he says in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's go into the Hebrew on that. Bereshit, in the beginning, bara. Now, bara is a verb that means create. It literally means to create something from nothing. It's not like the little child that comes into the kitchen with a mud pie and says, look, mommy, look what I created. I made a mud pie. That's not the way it is. You just took some things that already existed and you put them into a pan and then you made this and you poured this on it and you made something, but you did not create something. Only God creates. Only God bara something, you see. Bara means to make something from nothing. To make something from nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshit bara Elohim. So it had to come from nothing. Well, that's exactly what the scientists are telling us today. Even though it sounds absurd, even though you can't possibly prove it by logic, they're basically saying First there was nothing, and then it exploded. Now, if you don't believe in God, do you realize how stupid that sounds? How silly that sounds for you to say that you believe that there was nothing, and then it exploded? Do you realize how silly that sounds? But yet in the Bible, that's exactly what he's saying. First there was nothing, and then God created everything from it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The second thing that you want to know is you see in Hebrew, of course, as all my Hebrew speakers will already know, in Hebrew, you have tenses, and you have gender, and you have numerical agreement with the subjects and with nouns. For example... If I said, who bara, I would have said, he created. Bara is past tense, third person, singular. It means it's to be used with the word he. He created something. In Hebrew, that's who bara. Who bara, who means he, and bara means created from nothing. So you would usually say, if God created something, you would not say Elohim bara something because something in im as the ending on a Hebrew noun means that it's masculine plural. It's more than one. You would say Elohim barim because the verb has to agree with the noun. But in this case, God is showing us something special about himself. If you and I had made something or created something, if it was possible for us to make something from nothing, we would say, we would say, him barim, or they created. Him barim, the im on the end of each of the words there. But why does he use Elohim, the plural form of God, with the single form of the verb bara instead of the plural form barim? And the reason is, is because he's telling us he is more than one 
but yet he is one. Bara says he is one, but Elohim says that somehow he's more than one. You would never do that in Hebrew. Only God could do that and claim that, and that simply says he's telling us something we don't know about him, that he's not like you and I. He is vastly higher, more sophisticated, infinitely intelligent compared to us. Can you exist? Can you, uh, can you comprehend the existence of God? No one can. No one can. He's infinite. He's everlasting. He's outside time. He spoke all into existence from nothing. You can't comprehend anything about Him. He is God. That's why you and I are just men and women on this earth walking around and we see His wonders and we wonder about Him. We wonder what He's like, who He is. Then we wonder why we're here, why we're different. Well, as we read this verse today, it's an open door to where we want to go in the next few weeks as we go on this remarkable journey through creation in the greatest book of the greatest book of all time. In the book of Genesis in the Bible. The book that introduces us to God. God did all of this. He gave us all the prophecies. He's telling us all the story. He showed us all of these wonders if that we might be drawn to Him and desire to know Him and fall in love with Him and be restored to the everlasting existence that He designed us for. Are you ready? This is going to be the most remarkable journey you can ever take.